Hey everybody, what is going on? Professor Tomney here from Chem Complete, and we are going to start our analysis of SN1 reactions. So we're going to jump right into this. Just a notice for those of you that may be joining us for this lecture and haven't seen the previous lectures. The SN2 reactions are very, very important to understanding in order for our lead up to the SN1 reactions to make sense. So if you haven't viewed those videos, I would strongly encourage you to go back and view them. Uh, we're going to be picking up a lot of information here that we already picked up in the SN2 videos, and I'm sort of just going to breeze over it because I went into quite a bit of detail in the SN2 videos when we were talking about that. But with that being said, there are major differences between SN1 and SN2, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of that. So, SN1 reactions, substitution and nucleophilic stay the same, but now the 1 means unimolecular instead of bimolecular. And so what this is going to mean is that we are only dependent on the leaving group leaving before the nucleophile comes in. So coming over here to the whiteboard, I'm going to draw a general example where there's a carbon. We're going to have three R groups, and we'll talk about why in just a second. And there is some leaving group X, right? So in an, whoops, in an SN, undo that. In an SN1 reaction, we're going to pick out a nucleophile. In this case, I'm picking out water because SN1s tend to like mild nucleophiles, and we're going to talk about that in a minute as well. And here's what would happen. We've already said this cannot come in at the same time the leaving group is leaving because there's too much steric hindrance if we were talking about an SN2 type reaction because this is tertiary, this X, this leaving group. So what's going to have to happen is the leaving group is going to have to leave without the assistance from the nucleophile. When that happens, I come down here and I get a three-membered intermediate carbocation. And that is exactly why we wanted tertiary, because tertiary carbocations get the benefit of uh, hyperconjugation and inductive effects from these additional R groups. So this is really step one, and this is also going to be the rate limiting step. And that's because carbocations are very, very reactive. Uh, so they're not going to hang around for long. The moment that this is present, we would have the H2O come in and attack that carbocation. After we have that, we would have the nucleophile, but the nucleophile would come in. If it's neutral, it's going to come in with a charge, because remember, H2O doesn't just become OH suddenly. It comes in as H2O. And so we would have this intermediate as well. And then finally, we could get another water to come in and remove one of these protons, right? And that could give us the final alcohol, uh, which we're actually we're going to put up here because it completes the reaction at that point. Okay. So at a minimum, a bare minimum, an SN1 should have two steps. You have to get the leaving group out to form the carbocation. That's one step, and that is the rate limiting step in terms of the kinetics. And then the second step, at a minimum, you need to have a nucleophile come in uh, to satisfy that carbocation. Most of the time, you'll have a third step, which is that the nucleophile that is present will then have to be deprotonated in some form or have some other type of group removed from it to donate electrons back to the nucleophilic atom and then you'll end up in your neutral state up here and finish your SN1 reaction. Uh, if you look at the mechanism, a little bit more complex than the SN2, right? Because the SN2 was really one concerted step. Nucleophile comes in, leaving group leaves. We're done. This is more complicated. In terms of the kinetics for an SN1 reaction, remember when we were talking about this, so the rate of an SN1 reaction is going to depend on the rate constant K times Rx. So it is only dependent on how fast the leaving group can leave. And that is a very, very important point. So we're going to put that here. Okay, and SN1 depends on leaving group leaving. So we'll abbreviate leaving group leaving. That is the heart of the SN1 reaction. As soon as I generate the carbocation, Almost instantaneously, nucleophile will come after carbocation. We finish the reaction. This is the rate limiting step. 
and it is this leaving group, Rx, it's the X getting off of the, the alkyl group, the rest of the molecule, that really limits the SN1. So that should tell you something, which is that the type of leaving group we have in, in an SN1 is going to be absolutely vital to the rate of the reaction. Whereas before, the leaving group was important, but the nucleophile was also important. When we come into an SN1, it's really going, the rate of the reaction is going to be dependent on that leaving group. The nucleophile, I could pick out various nucleophiles. They will not get to play any type of effect on the rate of my SN1 reaction, okay? Because once the carbocation is formed, any nucleophile nearby is going to come and attack it. So it's really that one portion there. Okay, so position of the leaving group. The big thing here with SN1 is that we are creating carbocations. And so, whereas in SN2 we dealt with sterics, in SN1 we are going to consider electronics. Okay, so stability of the carbocation that is left behind. And because of this, we have a certain ranking that we need to consider. So outside of resonance of any sort, we are now going to flip what was originally the SN2 backwards and say now tertiary is the best because tertiary carbocations are better than secondary carbocations are certainly better than primary and methyl. Okay, I'm also going to throw back in here because we mentioned it, the vanillic, I'm going to abbreviate here, the vanillic uh, positioning, which is basically when you are right on top of a double bond. So if I put a carbocation charge right on top of this double bond right here. That would be considered a vanillic carbocation. Uh, big no-no. You are not able to do that. So this is in the bad region, the bad section of the leaving groups, again, for SN1. Keep in mind, this is flipped for SN2 minus the vanillic. The vanillic is bad in both cases. When we get above tertiary, we still have some others to consider and the other ones we have to consider are allylic and benzylic and both of these are resonance stabilized and they are going to be considered better choices than tertiary so an allylic carbocation can look very close to a vanillic it is one space away from a double bond but it is not on top of the double bond big big difference here because now I have resonance stability where I can shift my double bond and spread out this plus charge in two positions. Now a lot of students will say, isn't this a primary carbocation and that's a secondary? No, right? Because delocalization means that it, the plus charge is delocalized between both of these positions at the same time. The, the inductive effects and the hyperconjugation effects are going to be so minimal in comparison to the effects of resonance that this is a much better choice when we are um, going through this process. And so we would rank allylic here. And then up there, I think I'm going to run out of room because of my toolbar here, we would have benzylic. Benzylic puts a plus charge one carbon away from a benzene ring. So just like vanillic, you could have it on a benzene ring. Allylic is one way from a double bond benzylic specifically and this point right here this is a carbon this is a ch2 this carbocation right so i could continue a chain this way but this carbocation is one carbon away from the ring and this ring is going to have several different positions where it could offer resonance structures and so this one has uh, four resonance structures, you get three around the ring plus this fourth one right up here in the original position. This one would have two resonance structures. So the benzylic, might be able to fit a B on there, but we'll put it on our big sheet, would go right there. So the ranking, because we're dealing with carbocations, is going to be benzylic, okay? And then after that, we would rank allylic. Then we would rank our tertiary. So now we're starting to get into the hyperconjugation instead of the, um, what do you call it, the resonance effects, right? And then I would have secondary. Secondaries are still pretty decent for SN1s. And then you get to primary. That will not undergo SN1. You need to be doing SN2 for that. 
even more so methyl, you should always be critical of any times there's a, a methyl carbocation present. Those should not exist. All right, and then the vanillic. And so this would be the ranking, the order where benzylic is best, vanillic is worst for the position of the leaving group in an SN1. Because again, let's put down here and remind ourselves we're dealing with electronics in this case. This is not a steric argument. This is more of an electronic argument when we get to SN1. Stability of carbocations. Stability of carbocation. Okay. Very nice thing that we're going to get to breeze over. The We've talked about leaving groups. Go back and look at that lecture in the SN2. I think it's the SN2 part two lecture. We talked about that weak bases make strong leaving groups. Leaving groups are leaving groups, and so they are not going to change order in SN1 or in SN2 reactions. So in other words, a tosylate is the best leaving group for SN1 reactions and SN2 reactions, and iodine is next, so on and so forth. So this portion, when we talk about the leaving groups, that remains the same. So if you want details about that, go back and take a look at the SN2 lectures, because like I said, some of this we're going to kind of be breezing over. Okay. So the next one, the choice of nucleophile, we talked about how the same atoms were going to parallel basicity to nucleophilicity. We increase going down a column and negative charged are stronger than the neutral ones. It turns out that when we are dealing with an SN1 reaction, we are interested in mild neutral nucleophiles. Okay, So we're trying to stay away from some of those, um, I misspelled that, nucleophiles. We we're trying to stay away from the really heavy hitters, the negative charged ones. Remember, those were good in SN2 because we wanted the nucleophile to get in and attack the carbon at the same time the leaving group was leaving. We needed a lot of energy built up in that nucleophile. Here, okay, when and let me clear the drawing board for this. When I'm dealing with an SN1 reaction, for an SN1, right, the leaving group has to leave, and the more space you give the leaving group, the better in order to get rid of it, right? So let's put, we'll put bromine here. That's about middle of the road. So if I have a nucleophile like H2O versus minus OH, right? Minus OH is a negatively charged aggressive nucleophile, and this is a weaker mild nucleophile, the water in its protonated form. So the water is a little bit better at sort of hanging out and chilling out before the leaving group leaves and then it will come and rush in to assist the carbocation. Whereas this negatively charged high energy nucleophile would like to start trying to make its way in and could potentially start interfering with bromine as bromine is trying to leave, okay? now. That means that the mild one that stays out of the way and doesn't try to attempt to come in, right, because this pathway would be shut down too much steric hindrance, the bromine needs time to do its thing to leave and then the carbocation forms, okay? Once the carbocation forms, then water can come in. Minus OH would also come into a carbocation without a doubt. The thing is that we would like to try to get a nucleophile that is not going to be as aggressive as the leaving group is trying to leave. Okay, something that's a little more, more mild. And so we pick out the, uh, the neutral nucleophiles to give the leaving group its space, allow it to leave uh, in a timely fashion. And then these nucleophiles that are neutral can come in and these would both give the same result, right? As far as if I substitute minus OH or if I put H2O on, I'll get rid of one of these protons. Both of them will end up with an alcohol. So at the end of the day, I'm still going to have R, 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 and then I have OH here, right? So that is uh, not going to change whether I'm using either of these, but why not pick out this one if this is going to help in terms of the energetics of the reaction and giving the leaving group enough room to leave before we have this come in. All right. Uh, so I think that's good for part one. And then we will go over the choice of solvent, which will be the opposite of what SN2 was. And we'll talk about product considerations in the second lecture. So thank you guys for joining me for this one. Please remember to like and comment if you enjoyed the video or have any questions. If you hit that subscribe button, you will get updates as soon as I put these videos out and you will be up to date and ready for your tests. So I hope to hear from you guys. And other than that, thanks for taking the time to learn with me and I will see you guys for the next lecture.